I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin nation, and pay my respect to the elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. So, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's Wednesday seminar speaker, Rania Salvermoser, who started her PhD in late 2014 in my lab under the supervision of Andreas and myself. So Rania did her master's thesis in, uh, in the lab of Barbara Conrad at the LMU in Munich, and she's well known for unraveling the apoptotic regulators in C. elegans. And so Rania was kind of interested from the beginning to do her thesis also in some one or the other way in cell death or apoptosis. So when she applied to my lab, she had really impressive marks, and so for Andreas and me, it was a no-brainer that we would accept her as a PhD student. And I was also personally a little excited because Rania is from Bavaria. And so I was thinking that this region is known for, you know, great beer and meat-based foods. And so that's a bonus. However, I learned very quickly that Rania is vegan. <laughs> and she's, she's tried unsuccessfully to convert me to the dark side. Um, however, let's not hold this against her because she's awesome at brewing beer. And this is um, most, I think, Demonstra best demonstrated, she won twice the Weehai Beer Brewing Award, which is organized by the postdocs. So fantastic. Back to the science. As I said, she worked with an NC Elegance, and so when she came here, obviously, she started a very mouse-heavy project, as most of our PhD students do in our lab, and so she had to learn how to deal with animals which are bigger than worms. <laughs> a few mouse bites later, she was, became very familiar with her new model system, and she even developed a highly caring attitude towards his mice, um, because during certain experiments, she decided to go down in their mouse rooms with a sleeping bag and sleep there overnight, and looking after the mice by measuring their temperature every 15 to 30 minutes and weighing them really until the early morning to make sure that none of them experiences any discomfort. And this is actually a quality of Rania, once she has had put on something, she shows great commitment to things she feels strongly about. Her PhD project has progressed well, and she has initiated the right collaborations, and this also brought, and also brought new techniques into the division. You would see in the first part of the talk, um, this is now, we have sent this to already um, for publication. It's under revision, it's cell and differentiation. And we anticipate that from the rest, we will at least have another two stunning papers. So welcome, Rania, and we look forward to your talk on the many roles of CAS spaces in programmed cell death, inflammation, and immune defense. Over to you. Hello, we hi there all. Um, I'm just gonna get started right away. So as you heard, I thank you very much for a very kind introduction. I don't eat meat, that's true. Um, as you've heard, I was always interested in cell death and um, one of the major players in cell death are caspases. And these days I have a love-hate relationship towards caspases and you'll find out why. So caspases fulfill critical roles in cell killing as well as cytokine activation. And classically, they are grouped into three major families the inflammatory caspases, as well as the apoptotic caspases, which can be further subdivided into initiator as well as effector caspases. However, as research into both of these fields, inflammation and apoptosis, progresses, it's become evident that there are many more cell death pathways where caspases um, are very important, and also that some caspases actually exist that play a role in both inflammation as well as cell death. So let's take a look at some of the three of the uh, major programmed cell death pathways, apoptosis, necroptosis, and pyroptosis. If you take a closer look, it becomes, it, um, becomes quite evident that in each of these, these um, programmed cell death pathways, caspases play a crucial role, and so all of these cascades rely on the activity of caspases, as here highlighted in blue. So therefore, mutations or dysregulations in any of these proteins can really affect inflammation or cell death. And most of us already know that dysregulations in cell death or inflammation can have um, really bad disease outcomes. For example, too little cell death could cause cancer or immune disorders, whereas a surplus of killing can lead to neurodegenerative disorders or sepsis. 
So therefore, understanding the individual functions of cash spaces as well as their underlying regulatory mechanisms is really crucial for us to be able to manipulate inflammatory and non-inflammatory cell death pathways for therapeutic um, purposes. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of caspases as well, and then we're going to end up where we are today. What happened in 1989? Why do we all remember 1989? Well, Nintendo released the Game Boy. In Germany, the wall came down. In Europe, Madonna, Madonna's hit Like a Prayer was in the charts for weeks at a time. And the, the one and only reason we all remember 1989, of course, is the discovery of Caspase 1. <laughs> so what's Caspase 1? So as I said, in um, 1981 uh, 1989, Caspase 1 was discovered, and really um, then, three decades ago, the history of Caspases um, started. And with this discovery, with this aspartate-specific protease that has the ability to cleave pro-interleukin-1 beta proform into its biologically active form IL-1 beta, um, and it was, um, this is what set off um, the understanding about these enzymes, uh, these Caspases. And ICE, interleukin-1 converting enzyme is now referred to as caspase 1. So what you can see here when we transfect cells with ISO caspase 1 and also give them pre, um, proform interleukin-1 beta, caspase 1 is able to cleave this proform into its active form running on western blot at about 17 kilodalton. So further research into this um, unraveled that not only can caspase 1 cleave, but also secrete IL-1 beta. So if caspase 1 is deleted in cells upon certain stimuli that we understand better now, there is no secretion of IL-1 beta. And furthermore, this decreases cell death significantly, and cytotoxicity is, as you can see, very low in cells lacking caspase 1 and, cas uh, and, maybe, and caspase 1 and together with 11. So later on, another caspase joined the party, and that was ICH3. ICH3 is now known as caspase 11. One significant difference between caspase 11 and caspase 1 is the fact that caspase 11 requires an initial stimulus to be upregulated for expression. So as you can see here, only after a um, couple of hours of LPS treatment, we can actually see the expression of caspase 11 on Western blot. Also what has been shown is that mice deficient for caspase 11 are significantly protected against septic shock in vivo upon LPS treatment. So as you can see here, caspase 11 deficient mice survive significantly longer compared to um, wild type mice after LPS. And this is due to cytokine, lack of cytokine secretion. And later on, in 2011, it was published that caspase 11 really is the sensor for gram-negative bacteria. So what's shown here on the left is that when cells are lacking caspase 11, so in the red bars, they do not secrete IL-1 beta. However, this is fully dependent on a gram-negative stimuli or bacteria such as E. coli. Also, the lack of caspase 11, so in red, in red or together with 11, uh, with one in black, um, uh, reduces cytotoxicity significantly. So if we delete caspase 11, these cells will survive a lot longer. So taking all this data together, we now know that caspases 1 and 11 are responsible for pyroptotic cell death. So upon host invasion by a pathogen, these caspases will become activated, and this will lead to, on the one hand, um, lytic cell death induced by the cleavage of gastrumin D, and on the other hand, inflammation induced by the secretion um, an activation of IL-1 beta and IL-18. The last caspase, inflammatory caspase I would like to introduce today is caspase 12. Caspase 12, as you can see here, is closely clustered together with 1 and 11 on the mouse locus, and it has been suggested to have an inf uh, an, a function in inflammation. Furthermore, in vitro, it's been suggested that caspase 12 actually plays a role in apoptosis triggered by ER stress stimuli. In humans, caspase 12 is polymorphic. So that means that there are two forms floating around, a long and a short caspase 12, the short form being non-functional due to an early stop codon. Only about 20 to 80 percent of sub-Saharan Africans actually carry the long functional form of caspase 12, where most of us, Caucasians and Asians, have the short non-functional form. So basically, we're all knockouts for caspase 12. And overall, the function of caspase 12, whether in mice or in humans, remains enigmatic. 
So the first project I would like to talk about is the triple knockout mice 111 and 12. They're lacking 111 and 12. And really what we wanted to address with these mice is first of all, dive deeper into the function of Caspase 12 and try to understand what Caspase 12 really does together with Caspases 1 and 11 and also by itself in terms of, in the context of inflammation as well as various different cell death pathways. And so furthermore, we will wanted to characterize the functions of these three caspases um, better and get a better understanding of how they work. So when I started working here, I was fortunate enough that these mice were already made. And um, the way they were designed is that the genomic locus encompassing caspases 1, 11, and 12, they're clustered quite tightly together. So this locus was replaced and thereby deleted using this targeting vector depicted here in a single deletion step. And once this vector was introduced, it was subsequently excised using flip fret mediated rec um, recombination. What's important to say is that these mice are on a black six background and this targeting strategy or knockout strategy was done using um, the, um, the old school ESL targeting. So let's dive a bit further into pyroptosis since I'm going to talk a lot about caspases 1 and 11. So pyroptosis has two arms. There's a canonical and a non-canonical inflammasome. And the canonical inflammasome is dependent on the function of caspase 1. And really to activate this pathway, we need two stimuli. We need stimulus 1, which is also considered a priming signal, which will be recognized by receptors that are sitting on the cell membrane. The signal can either be a PAMP or a DAMP, so a pathogen-associated molecular pattern or a death-associated molecular pattern. Pathogen-associated is, as the name already suggests, from a pathogen, so it could be proteins from the type 3 secretion system or viral RNA, whereas a death signal is host-derived, so it could be a transcription factor or a cytokines, for example. So once the signal is um, transduced across the membrane, we require a second so-called activation signal. And this, again, can be in form of a PAMP or a DAMP. Once this has been recognized by a cytosolic knot-like receptor, this knot-like receptor, together with caspase 1, as well as sometimes an adapter protein, will assemble into a very large multimeric protein complex labeled the inflammasome. This is very similar to the apoptosome, and it also serves as an activation platform for caspase 1. So once caspase 1 is um, on the inflammasome, it will become activated and then can fulfill its functions, which are, again, two functions. One, on the, on the right side here, it will activate gastumin D. It will cleave gastumin D, so this can then integrate itself into the membrane and, and lead to a lytic cell death. And on the other hand, caspase 1, as explained at the beginning, can cleave and secrete cytokines such as IL-1-beta and lead to inflammation. So to make sure that my mice really are knockout, we wanted to validate that. And as signals in vitro, I used LPS for priming and ATP as the cytosolic signal, as depicted here. And the first thing to do is, of course, make sure that no caspase 1 protein levels um, are secreted or produced. And I did that simply by looking at myeloid cells on Western blot. And as you can see, our knockouts lack, um, show no pro-caspase 1. When activating caspase 1 via, via the pathway I just explained with priming and activating, we looked for cytokine secretion in the supernatin of myeloid cells, primary myeloid cells. And as you can see, in wild type, we get a nice signal of IL-1-beta, which is lacking in our knockout mice. And as an additional control, I use the 111 mice. Caspase 11 constitutes the second arm of pyroptosis, the non-canonical inflammasome, which again requires two signals, a priming signal, and as I told you earlier, caspase 11 is really the sensor for gram-negative bacteria, so this has to be LPS, and an activation signal, which again is cytosolic um, LPS. And we really require LPS as a priming signal because caspase 11, as I said, is not transcribed, constitutively transcribed, and will only become transcribed in the cell once the priming signal has been sensed. So upon activation and sensing LPS directly, LPS, uh, caspase 11 can, um, can activate two pathways or lead to two outcomes. On the one hand, it can activate the caspase 1 canonical um, pyroptotic pathway, which will result in cytokine secretion as well, as well as pyroptosis. And caspase 11 can directly lead to pyroptosis also by gastumin cleavage, and thereby gastumin can punch holes into the membrane. So in my case, for caspase 11 activation, obviously, we used LPS for priming and LPS in the cytosol. 
Again, looking at protein levels to see whether our mice are knockout, and as you can see, after priming these cells, so that is, caspase 11 becomes expressed, this seems fine, our mice lack caspase 11. Looking at activation signals, uh, looking at activation by um, IL-1 beta secretion, as expected, no IL-1 beta is secreted upon priming and then trans, um, transfecting LPS via lipofectamine into the cells. So for caspase 12, unfortunately, back in, back in the day, three years ago, we didn't have a um, good antibody for Western blot, and so I looked at RNA expression in various organs. And as an example, I'm showing you brain and lung, and um, as I said, we checked for RNA levels by qPCR, and you can see the red bars that are missing, ND standing for non-determined, not not done. This means that we didn't have expression of caspase 12, and we were confident now that our mice are knockouts, and HMBS served as a control. So we also wanted to get an idea of the hematopoietic system of these mice to see if something affected, do these caspases play a role in development of BET or myeloid cells. And just an example, I'm showing you the myeloid cell compartment here because that would have probably been the most interesting considering that it is really the myeloid cells that play an important role in the innate immune defense and the first line of defense against pathogens. And to cut a long story very short, looking at um, various different cells, myeloid cells, B cells, and T cells, and like, for example, here when I stained for GI1 and MAC1, and then we looked at percentages as well as numbers, we didn't really see any striking differences. We didn't see differences in distributions um, or numbers or percentages in the B cell, T cell, and myeloid line. So enough about me. Let's go back into the history lesson. What has been published in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s, is that when, cas when mice are lacking caspase 1 or ice, they are resistant to septic shock. Well, that's kind of confusing because I just told you that it's caspase 11 that's responsible for sensing, for, um, sensing LPS or gram-negative bacteria. So either I was lying or something was funny here. And it was the letter. So a few years ago, in 2011, another paper actually cleared all of this confusion up. So Vishwar Dix's group showed that these mice, these ones, the cas caspase 1 knockout mice, were generated on a 129S um, cell background. And when using these 129S cells, as you can see, no caspase 11 is uh, produced. And in black 6, we get caspase 11. And what was found is that it's due to the fact that these 129 generated caspase 1 knockout mice carry a five base pair mutation in the caspase 11 gene, and therefore it's not transcribed. So really, caspase 1 mice are actually caspase 111 double knockout mice, and a lot of the data had to be cleared up. What they also showed in the same paper is that truly it is caspase 11 that is required for sensing LPS, and really it is caspase 11 that is required for also then activating caspase 1 and thereby cytokine secretion as um, shown here. And what he could show is that when we knock out caspase 11, these, these mice are highly resistant to septic shock, even more so if we knock out caspases 1 and 11. So now here comes Rania with the triple knockout mice 1, 11, and 12. And the question is, we do have a high resistance, but we don't have a complete protection. There's still about 40% that will come down. So the question is, if we knock out caspase 12 on top, will we actually rescue these 40%? Is it the entire inflammatory locus that plays a role? So that's what we wanted to address initially with the 111-12 mice. We wanted to see, replicate this data and see, do we get complete protection? So that's what Marco was talking about earlier, the LPS septic shock models. Um, that kept me awake for quite a long time at the time. Um, we injected, in this case, high-dose LPS and worked our way up to high-dose at 54 mg per kg. And as you can see in blue, the 111 mice that were published by Vishva already um, come down at about 15 hours, and our triple knockout mice come down at a similar time frame. And we confirmed these findings by looking at cytokine secretion after four hours of LPS um, administration. So I also wanted to get an idea of if caspase 12 plays a role in any of the cytokines that are being secreted to really get an understanding of what does this caspase actually do. And again, to cut a long story short, we looked at 26 different cytokines in the blood at 18 and 54 milligrams per kilogram LPS, and we didn't see differences between the 111, 111, 12, or wild-type cytokine secretion levels. So overall, we didn't see a full protection of the triple knockout mice compared to the double knockout mice and no additional um, functions in cytokine secretion. If you paid really well attention, you might have seen that in Nobu's paper, the mice go up to 100 hours 
whereas mine only go to 15. So um, what's going on here? Well, this is actually quite simply explained by the fact that the discrepancy, there's massive discrepancies between the ethical restrictions in the US versus Australia, which I'm um, quite glad about. So we have to take the mice when they come down to 33 degrees core body temperature, which, that, which is why I had to measure every hour or every half an hour um, without trying to distress the mice, because if you imagine where you would measure the temperature, you have to make sure to not cause inflammation. So I had about half a year going through diff testing out lubes. <laughs> um, so, where was I? Um, <laughs> that lube thing just flew me off here. Um, so, as you can see, and in the US, actually, I asked this group and I asked, well, what's the difference here? Why, wh wh what's your cell death? And they said, well, when the mouse is dead the next morning when I come in. And I said, what's the temperature? And they're like, cold. So, really, the difference. <laughs> so, that's a, so, that is, I think that's also pretty cruel, actually. So, um, this is the first explanation, whereas the second explanation is also you need to take into consideration the microbiota of these mice that they get from the environment. For example, if, if our mouse house is very clean compared to the mouse houses in the US, say that's really dirty, then they already have a higher threshold of, um, of accepting bacteria not going into sepsis as quickly as bacteria, uh, mice that are not used to these bacteria in the environment. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, caspase 12 has been said to play a role in ER stress-induced apoptosis, and we wanted to follow up on that. So as you can see here, in caspase 12 um, single knockout lines, cell lines, the, there's a significant protection against cell death when, when treated with tunicamycin or tapsigargan, so drugs that induce ER stress, whereas we can't see this in other cases. Also, this paper claimed that these single knockout mice are highly protected against ER stress in vivo when looking at tunnel positive staining, so apoptosis levels in the kidneys. So we were again wondering if we knock out 1, 11 and 12, do we see even more protection or does it somehow affect ER stress response? So I looked at various different cell death pathways and I started with looking at intrinsic apoptosis. So I induced intrinsic apoptosis looking at taxol and etoposide, and then with our bioflow cytometry, just looked at the cell death um, overall. And as you can see in our double, in our triple knockout mice, there's no significant differences. Also, I wanted to look at the TNF receptor pathway, and this really can, depending on the drug, drug cocktail you administer, this can lead to two outcomes. If you use TNF um, ligand as well as smegmomatic, this will activate caspase eight and you will get apoptosis. However, if you throw in um, pan-caspase inhibitor QVD to those two drugs additionally, this will inhibit caspase eight, relieving the, its inhib inhibitory effect on RIP3, activate MLKL, and then MLKL can induce, um, can integrate into the membrane and also lead to a lytic necroptotic cell death. So we can really shift the response um, to necroptosis or apoptosis depending on the drug cocktails. And we did this in fibroblast and um, from our triple knockout mice. And as you can see, over time, uh, we still didn't see a massive difference or protection in our triple knockout cell lines. I also, just out of interest, looked at myeloid cells. And the same holds true here as well. When we look at the treated wild type in black, treated knockouts, we don't really see an overall protection or these cells doing less well. And last but not least, following up on the paper and on some of the claims in the literature, we looked at ER stress via tunicamycin and thepsigargan. And somewhat surprisingly, we actually couldn't see a protective role when knocking out caspases 1, 11, and 12. And to follow up further on this paper, we also looked at in vivo stress. So we uh, used tunicamycin. Um, and I really need to thank Kerstin, Lorraine, and Lockie here for these experiments. And we, after treating these mice for 24 hours, we took the kidneys and we used tunnel staining to assess uh, apoptotic cell death. And then we used two ways on the, um, by, for scoring for apoptotic cells. Um, with Lockie's help, we did computational analysis, and I also, we also did blind scoring under the microscope to look for protection. And in neither of the cases did we see any protection of our knockout mice for ER stress or against ER stress. So to summarize, characterizing this mouse model, which will then lead through all the other um, um, projects that I want to introduce. So far, these mice seem quite happy and healthy, and even though I haven't shown you the data, believe me, their offspring, offspring is in expected Mendelian ratios. They grow up to old age and phenotypically, phenotypically look completely fine. Also, the hematopoietic system seems unaffected. 
And when looking at septic shock in vivo, they appear to have no more protection than the Caspase 111 mice that have already been published by um, Nobu. Also, we so far could not find any effect of Caspase 12 in cell death and ER stress response in vitro and in vivo. However, what I do want to note is two facts. First of all, Caspase 12 might be tricky like Caspase 11 that it needs a certain stimulus to become activated or to become highly expressed. Like it took quite a while to figure out what Caspase 11 does because we didn't know what the stimuli are to express it. So maybe that's the same case in Caspase 12. Also, if potentially Caspase 12 is somewhat a regulator of Caspases 1 and 11, we're aware that if you knock out all three together, you might be masking any effects, any um, protective effects or so forth. So let's go back to the, card, to the caspases, the large caspase family. What I'd like to focus on now are the card-containing caspases. So what I haven't mentioned earlier is that most caspases have a large N-terminal prodomain, as you can see. The card domain, so the caspase activation and recruitment domain, or the death effector domain. Whereas the effector caspases lack either of those. So when we focus only on the mouse card containing caspases, these are 1, 11, 12, 2 and 9, because caspases 4 and 5 are the human orthologs to caspase 11. And we were interested in that card containing caspase family. So caspase 2, um, I would like to shortly introduce, it has been suggested to be involved in the DNA damaging response and in aging. So when we knock out caspase 2, the mice look, they don't age as well. And it's also been suggested to be a tumor suppressor. So even in a hetero, um, hetero if, even if you knock out one allele of caspase two, <laughs> in an immunic background, these mice um, show accelerated tumorigenesis. And more recently, a paper showed that caspase two also plays a role in cytokinesis and genome integrity. So when knocking it out, um, this can lead to polyploidy. Caspase 9 doesn't really need a lot of introduction. As I said earlier, um, it's involved it's, um, as an initiator caspase in the apoptotic pathway, in the intrinsic pathway, where it, once it becomes activated via the apoptosome, will lead to the activation of effector caspases 367 and thereby lead to silent suicide or apoptosis. It also, um, when we knock out caspase 9 in mice, these mice are embryonic lethal, which makes it quite tricky to study. So, um, as you can see, I'm quite fortunate to be in a lab that, where we have access to a lot of mice, and I'm even more so fortunate that Andreas is, does not shy away from crossing the most craziest combinations, um, which I'm actually quite grateful about. So, what we wanted to do is create a mouse that is completely deficient for all card-containing caspases, and that is quite interesting for the fact that in, in this worm, in the nematode C. elegans, which as you heard I'm a fan of, if you knock out set three, the only card containing caspase, that actually leads to no cell death. So um, you completely ablate apoptosis. So this might suggest that if we do the same in mice, or maybe later on humans, that we also block apoptosis and, set, um, and we get high resistance of cells to cell death. And also, potentially, there's a redundancy in the card-containing caspase family, because why do they all have such a conserved um, similar prodomain? So to get these mice, I crossed my triple knockout mice with the caspase 2.9 mice, and after serial intercrosses, got 1.11.12.2.9. And as I said, we wanted to address the question of um, whether these, um, all of these five caspases have overlapping functions, or whether there's some level of redundancy. So the first thing to do was look at embryonic development. And I am still in the process of learning that. And um, here I need to thank Francine for investing time to teach me how to look at embryos, because I'm not good at embryogenesis yet. And as you can see, when looking at this wild type on the left, in our quintuple knockout mice, really they seem quite fine. There's no gross um, abnormalities, which could be surprising if you look at the first Caspase 9 single knockout paper where the mice here, um, the single knockout Caspase 9 mice at already E10.5, embryonic stage 10.5, they showed this, these kind of broccoli heads. So there's the, their brain, the um, exencephaly is probably the better word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, However, this can also be quite easily explained, but first of all, I need to screen a lot more embryos. That aside, these mice were generated on a mixed background, 
Whereas our mice are on a um, straight black six, black six background, and it is known that there the phenotype is a lot less severe. So the next thing to look at was hematopoietic development and um, the cells and their survival upon treating them with different drugs. And as I said, caspase 9 renders these mice embryonic lethal, so I had to do fetal liver constitutions, so radiating a wild-type mouse and then injecting fetal liver cells from quintuple knockout embryos to be able to get a viable hematopoietic um, a mouse that had a quintuple knockout embryonic hematopoietic system. And we based a lot of this on a paper from a few years back from Vanessa Marsden, where she actually characterized the Caspase 2 9 double knockout mice. And what she saw, even though she knocked out Caspase 9, which is apparently like super important for intrinsic apoptosis, these cells, when um, treated with certain stimuli, still are able to undergo cell death. As you can see, after about um, two days, they still will die, or five days. When we look at thymocytes, there's no complete protection. However, there's a bit of a delay in cell death response. So I did very similar experiments looking at the, um, the cell death response, just letting them sit in culture and see if they will die, just like wild type, and they did. When treating them with drugs, for example, ionomycin, I see the same response that Vanessa had, where I see a delay in cell death. However, I do still see, see a dying a death response. And that is actually, I find that quite interesting because the system is lacking five very important caspases and yet it's still, these cells still manage to somehow kill themselves or die. So as a, obviously this project is kind of at the beginning because the next project came in first then. The, what we really want to do here is do some clonogenic survival assays and many, many more experiments. So as a summary of this project, what I've shown you is that so far, we don't really see gross abnormalities in the quintuple caspase 1, 11, 12, 2, 9 mockout mice in embryonic development. And we also don't see a complete protection in cell death. So, so far, we couldn't find an overlapping role between caspases 1, 11, 12, 2, and 9. So now let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I was also very fortunate to go over to the UK for a collaboration because what we haven't spoken about so far is caspase activation and the roles of caspases in the context of pathogenic, um, pathogenic insults or infection because we now know from the recent years that caspases play an important role not only in cell death but also infection and inflammation once a cell has become infected with, say, salmonella. So... I want to focus on the paraptotic pathway again and talk about Salmonella. Um, one of um, um, Andreas's friends and colleagues, Claire Bryant, is also very interested in uh, the redundancy in caspases and their functions. However, she's more interested in um, the functions of caspases in the sense of after in Salmonella infection. And since we are not the experts on Salmonella infections, I packed up a couple of um, legs from some of my mice and I flew over to her so we could combine some of the mice that we have with some of the Salmonella expertise that her lab has. So I went to the UK and I was obviously expecting to work at Trinity College in something at least as Harry Potter-like as this. And of course, my colleagues would be along the lines of Watson and Crick. Lo and behold, that was not true. I, I arrived in Cambridge, and I should have read beforehand that her lab is actually with the veterinary department, which means they're way out in the paddocks, because, of course, vet students learn about cows and, and pigs and horses. So this was our building, not quite like this. However, I really learned a lot over there, and it was really a good time. Um, and um, as I said, now we're going to talk about salmonella, so a slightly different... So salmonella is one of the major foodborne pathogens, and it is a global health threat. Uh, the World Health, health Organization published last year that about 30% of all deaths caused in children under five is due to salmonella poisoning. And also every year about 20 million people get infected with um, typhoid fever due to salmonella infections, and about 200,000 of those actually die. So as you can see, there really is a necessity for us to understand salmonella infections, the way they infect, and the clearance mechanism for two reasons. It's on the one hand for the medical reasons, really, to um, avoid all the lethalities, but also on an economical uh, standpoint, because there's a lot of food losses, and that really affects third world countries more than us, obviously. Salmonella can cause two different kinds of infections. It can cause a localized infection, but this can become systemic once it starts invading organs. And then this can cause typhoid fever. 
And as I've introduced a few times, um, pyroptosis is the clearance mechanism behind Salmonella, since Salmonella is a gram-negative bacteria. However, in recent years, it's become more and more obvious that it's not just caspases 1 and 11 that play a role in Salmonella clearance or in general pathogen clearance. Actually, caspase 8 plays a role in so much more than just um, apoptosis or necroptosis, and it somehow seems to, what um, Claire Bryant could actually show is that it somehow seems to be able to cleave IL-1 beta and actually in-house James Vince and Kate Lawler showed that as well in very complex settings, not Salmonella, but this really shows us that there are other caspases that play a role in various different pathways, and it's not as streamlined as we sometimes look at these um, cell death pathways. So we set out to make a mouse model that is lacking caspases 1, 11, 12, and 8, with RIP3 in the background. And RIP3 is required to be knocked out as additionally on top of caspase 8, because caspase 8 renders mice embryonic lethal. So we end up with, again, a quintuple mouse. And with this quintuple mouse, really, we wanted to address the questions of how Salmonella um, is cleared, how the infection um, really, how Salmonella really infects, and how the different caspases play a role in this infection pathway. So the first thing to um, what I did, and then I really need to th thank Paul Whitney as well, because I started this project in the UK, but of course I want to carry this further here, and none of what I'm going to show you now would have been possible without his help and Elise's help. Um, especially because he teaches me a lot about salmonella, which is very important. So I looked at um, cell death initially infecting um, myeloid, primary myeloid cells with an MOI of 50, so a multiplicity of infection of 50, which means for one macrophage we have 50 salmonella that could potentially infect. And what's been published already, um, wild type as well as caspase 8 single knockouts, as you see in blue and black, come down relatively early due to pyroptosis, and that there is a delayed response in caspase 1 and 11, and our triple knockouts kind of follow what has been published for the 111s. But we see a significant survival advantage when we knock out 1, 11, 12, and additionally on top caspase 8. And since I'm a trained biologist um, and not a clinician, I really love to push the boundaries. When I see something happening, I want to see how far can I go till the system really panics. Um, and I have been told that clinically this is not relevant, but I don't think always everything has to be clinically relevant. So I infected with a dose of 500. <laughs> 500 bacteria for one macrophage. I think that is highly stressful. However, the super mouse, 1, 11, 12, 8, rib 3, is still, even up to late time points, very highly resistant, as you can see. And we can even show this when looking straight down under the microscope. This was really exciting to see because the left side here shows you death, doom, and destruction. These are not cells. When we woggle the plate a little bit, this is just debris. There is nothing going on anymore. Whereas these uh, macrophages at 24 hours at 500, they even still, some of them grow on top of each other. So I think this really highlights that we are onto something here and it, that there is some redundancy potentially. Next was looking at cytokine secretion. Because, um, as I said, caspases play a role in cytokine secretion and therefore inflammation. And when we knock out caspases 1 and 11, really we get rid of the, um, the pyroptotic pathway that is caspase 11 dependent, as well as an inflammasome that has been suggested by um, Claire Bryant, where, as I said earlier, caspase 8 and caspase 1 play a role in cytokine secretion. So as expected, they get, we get a reduction. When we knock out caspase 8, we also see a reduction in cytokine secretion. But what was really cool for us to see is, if you knock out the, those together, there is absolutely no cytokine secretion anymore. And that is really interesting to see, because that really suggests that we are at the end of redundancy, and it doesn't seem like there's another pathway in check here. So, of course, next we were interested in in vivo, and um, Paul started infecting these, um, our super mice. Just to co not confuse you completely, here are all the controls. Wild type, 1, 11, 12, caspase 8, rib 3, 1, 11, 1, 11, 12, rib 3. It's somewhat confusing, but we'll get there. If we infect our mice um, IV, as you can see in the spleen, looking at titers, bacterial titers in the spleen, after about 21 days, we see a significant increase in bacterial cells in this organ. And when we follow up on this in the liver, we see even more bacteria in the liver. So really what this shows us is that our mouse, 1, 11, 12, 8, rib 3, is really struggling with clearing this infection in these organs. 
Next, we wanted to look at, we looked at the gallbladder. And as you can see, there's even more salmonella in the gallbladder. This mouse is truly a sponge and cannot, cannot deal with, cannot clear any of these salmonella bacteria inside of itself. And now let's go back to history. I'd like to tell a story about Typhoid Mary. So in the 1900s, a lady emigrated from, from the UK over to New York, and she, um, she loved cooking. She was a cook. But everywhere she cooked, she would infect everyone with salmonella poisoning. At her first job, seven out of eight people got sick, so she got fired. Then she went to Manhattan. Um, eight out of nine people got infected, two died. So she went, changed her name. She, but she always wanted to keep cooking. The problem was, though, what was interesting is that she was completely asymptomatic. She didn't have any salmonella symptoms, and she didn't have fever. However, everyone she fed would become sick or eventually die, and it's been reported that she alone was the, was the source of an outbreak of about, that led to about 3,000 people that were infected with salmonella poisoning. So she's now considered the first identified carrier of salmonella because post-mortem her gallbladder was taken out and it was shown that there was heap, a lot, a lot of salmonella in her gallbladder that was stored there, but nowhere else in her body. And this is kind of what we see here. You see that we have a lot of salmonella in the gallbladder. But what I want you to draw your attention to now is the fact that when we look at Caspase 111 and when we look at the wild type, we see that um, there's, quite, there's quite low numbers of um, salmonella, but if we knock out Caspase 12, there's, quite, there's a significant increase of um, salmonella in the gallbladder. And now this becomes exciting because I'm going to loop this whole talk around. So, <laughs> so this suggests to us really that Caspase 12 could have a function in shedding bacteria from the gallbladder into the gut and then shedding it out, right? Because if we knock it out, they're all stored in there and they're sequestered. If you remember at the very start, I told you not only that we really don't understand Caspase 12, but also that in humans, most of us are knockout for Caspase 12. We, have, we carry a non-functional truncated form and only a, lot, um, a small number of Southern Africans carry the long form. So let's just, hypothetically, what what could have happened is that maybe when we were traveling out of Africa in times of evolution, we all had Caspase 12 long. Um, however, um, it was more advantageous actually to mutate this form instead and stop shedding salmonella and causing more and more outbreaks as you carry along. So by mutating Caspase 12, you retain salmonella in the gallbladder, you stop shedding it, you don't infect your offspring, and you stay asymptomatic as a carrier, just like Typhoid Mary. So potentially, we're onto something here with Caspase 12, and I think that would be really exciting. So as a summary of the last part that I've shown you about salmonella um, and the paraptotic pathway here, what I've shown you is that really there are multiple ways to die in response to salmonella infections. And it's not just pyroptosis, it also appears that it could be apoptosis or necroptosis that play a role here as well. Also, there are multiple caspases that really play a role in inflammation as well as um, various cell death pathways. And we find, finally, a high degree of redundancy in this model. So, really what I want to take, what I want you guys to take home from this talk is that we, we can't look at these um, cell death pathways individually. They're not just one step after the other. There's really a lot of crosstalk. There is a lot of lateral movement of these caspases, and we really need to think of this in the big picture of an integration of different um, caspases with the potential of a lot of redundancy, and that, like I said, caspase 8 could, pl um, could play a role in pyroptosis and cytokine secretion and so forth, um, rather than a step-by-step -step north to south kind of um, pathway. So, I'm very glad that I left a few minutes for acknowledgements because I've got something at the end for Marco as well, which seemed great last night, but I'm not sure if I might embarrass, I'm sorry, it might be very embarrassing actually. I'll still do it though, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So first of all, I want to acknowledge a lot of people. If I forget someone here, I'm really sorry. Of course, my PhD committee and Andreas, and really I just want to say, um, follow up on everything that Suzanne has already said last year about Andreas, that he's not only brilliant, and actually what he doesn't know is, before I started my PhD, I already was um, stalking him quite a lot in all his papers. So, so it, was, it was a great honor, or is a great honor to work for Andreas. But he's also incredibly kind and caring for his students, and that really makes him stand out as a supervisor. 
My committee is also very great. Um, I, James really helped me with inflammation at the beginning. I would have been completely lost. John, to this day, scares me, especially his questions, and that will probably never stop, because I just, they're so long, I just can't follow. Um, but that really prepares you for conferences. I'm really glad that John really challenges his students, because I felt a lot more confident presenting in an audience where I didn't know people. Mark, also really helpful throughout my PhD with various different um, things in mice, and also worked with some people of his lab. Our division, absolutely ace. Um, we're very, everyone's very supportive. There's a lot of cake, really good division. Thank you for everyone that, um, inflammation, other divisions where I got a lot of it. Um, reagents, Herald Lab, best lab at WeHi, I'd say. We have a really good environment. It's a really positive vibe, and I really like that. Mouse rooms, I think you saw how much I do with uh, mouse experiments, and I really want to thank all the mouse techs that helped. The flow, flow cytometry lab, always keeping the machines up and running, which um, is taken for granted quite a lot. I think they're very helpful and um, I'm very grateful for all their work. Um, other people that helped me with when I went to the UK. Of course, I already mentioned the people from Semi's lab, especially Paul, couldn't thank him enough. And the Bryant lab and Clear and the people that I worked with. I do want to mention I um, pay my respects to all the mice that I had to take over the years because I think that's something we should not take for granted. Um, friends and family that unfortunately could not be here. One person that I really need to thank is Simon Monard, and I think a lot of people know that it's not just for the facts um, stuff that we do. From sailing to brewing beer, we've really grown a, a great friendship, and um, he's given me a, a home away from home when I was pretty much homeless, and without his support and without his help, I would definitely not be standing here today. I also want to thank my family and my brothers, without, um, without whose support I also wouldn't be here today. And my mum, who is um, an absolute ace in raising a very stubborn person, but um, she's very strong for being a single raising mum of three stubborn kids, and I respect that a lot. Um, so now to Marco. <laughs> oh God, I might embarrass the whole Herald lab, really. Sorry in advance. So I've written a little story late last night and it seemed really funny. <laughs> so there's one cell survival pathway I have not introduced yet. The Herald's PhD survival and support pathway. The initiator caspase called awesome specimen A is important for the catalysis and imp for, of immature little effector caspases that can be quite lost in the research environment. To be able to leave the mothership or fathership Fathership Lab, these caspases require a lot of attention, mentorship, encouragement, and support. Luckily, Amazing Specimen A um, has learned all about this and is fully capable of delivering the exact amount of support or challenge to activate um, and or let his targets mature, as you can see here. Um, one of the many defining factors that sets this mother mothership of all caspases apart from others is its capability to adapt to the shapes and needs of each of, his, um, in, of each of his little targets, or also known as bending over backwards, to, en <laughs> to ensure appropriate support and care um, these immature young proteins need to grow to full potential. Um, apart from this, the mothership of all caspases is also known to... Um, really adapt to their individual shapes and needs because some might need a little bit more, uh, some might be a little bit more catalytically active, others might be a slow burn. <laughs> and some might just be really stubborn and need a lot of attention and convincing. And in rare cases, inhibitory drugs, oh God, inhibitory drugs can come in the way of, indiv <laughs> of individual caspases and might slow their activity. However, Amazing specimen A knows how to keep his cast bases on, on track and how to intervene with enthusiasm, kindness, and the understanding that life in science doesn't always go one's way, and that PhDs are just little humans that, after all, sometimes need a little bit, bit of TLC and positive reinforcement. But also the initiator cast base slows down sometimes, in which case two simple catalysts are known to spark activity. The insertion of happy, heavy metal and cake. <laughs> Once the caspases are grown and mature, they unfortunately have to leave the lab and lab nest and venture out. 
And bit by bit, the Herald PhD survival support pathway will release its little minions, which will slowly take over the world and spread the highly contagious word of amazing specimen A, the great science learned and carried out in his lab, and the overall legend this Caspase truly is. So, thank you, Rania. Um, <laughs> very nice. Always good for surprise. So, let's start with the questions. Here's the first. Um, could you go back to your network choices trip from the Yeah. Um, sure. It'll come. You picked the one at the start. Oh, yeah, there it was. I know, you can just ask the question. Okay, so, you use, uh, you've got to use a pan cascade to induce necrotosis. Yeah. So does that inhibit one pathway that's going to be eleven and twelve? Yes, it, um, the pan caspase inhibitor, uh, we haven't used a specific one. Yeah, so in that case, are you masking any effect in the wild card compared to your knockouts by using that? Like, is there any scenario, say, you could knock out caspase A or if there's a caspase A specific inhibitor? We you know what I mean? Yeah, sort of. Um, we could potentially follow up on that by using more specific inhibitors, if that's what you mean, yes. Um, and yeah, potentially we could be masking effects by in the wild type using this treatment. But I believe sort of if we would have, if there was a really important protective role of say caspase 12, that even in the other scenarios and all the other treatments, some of which I haven't shown today, that we would have at some point seen some protection potentially. So, but yeah, it might be worthwhile to look at more specific inhibitors. Andrew. So, uh, I was very curious about your sub-Saharan epidemiology, but there are lots of healthy infections that are rather peculiar to that area. So I just wonder whether there's much known about these caspase pathways or helmets. Worms again. So, um, I'm not really familiar with Helmut's infections. Uh, all I can say is that with Caspase 12, even with those kind of infections, there's so little known. So, in general, there's really little known about that. But I haven't really looked into worm or Helmut infections, to be honest. Go with Jerry, and then, yeah. Well, how would you speculate that the link between so potentially what I'm assuming is that because in the wild type in the 111 we saw much less salmonella that maybe caspase 12 is required for the release of salmonella out out of the gallbladder and then to enter the gut, the digestive tract, and then be shed. So I could assume that maybe caspase 12 has a function in some kind of lysis, some kind of release, but for that to understand that, we first of all need to understand how and if even these salmonella are even released out of in our quintuple knockout mice. Um, to address that, I think the first step we want to do is, um, luckily, Mark also has the CRISPR lab, and now we have the single knockout caspase 12 mice, so it's just about ready. So I think, first of all, I will repeat these experiments in the single knockout to get a bit better understanding. And then probably look at the release from the gallbladder. Is there still release? And um, maybe look at the gut. Do we see bacteria in the gut? Or is it that they stay in there or they're not? Like, that's what I would probably do. Try to follow up on whether it's really the last organ and the last barrier. Simon. So it's along the same lines. Um, you showed in those salmonella experiments that you or you had no IL-1 beta production. Is it as simple as IL-1 beta is the mediator when you don't have it, you can't control salmonella, or is there something else? Um, that was a long question. I forgot the start when we come to the ending. I think there's more processes, not just R1 beta. I think R1 beta is very important for so the. If you were to infect an R1 beta knockout with mm. salmonella, what happens? I haven't done that. We haven't done that. I um, don't know. But that would be a good control to do on the side, you know? yeah. That would be good. Yeah. You mentioned that you were looking at or going to look at uh, caspase 2 knockouts with regards to chromosome stability and suppression of tumour development or something. 
I, was I? <laughs> when I get nervous, I say a lot of weird things, but I don't know. Yeah, that was published, like, yeah, that, yeah, that, was, that was uh, but published. it's so not, um, have I haven't looked at it, no. Like, so far, I'm going to try and focus on case space 12, but I've got the mice, it's, you know, we can do a lot of things. So, so you said these, um, one, two, three, for five knockouts. <laughs> yeah. Which knockout mice. Yeah. Um, don't make, don't secrete ILM beta, but their organs are full of salmonella. So I assume they die earlier than normal mice, or how else are they controlling that, that infection? They, they would come, the quintuple would come down sooner, they would die. Um, they, I'm, fairly positive that they wouldn't have made it a lot longer than what we had them at. So say three weeks, 21 days, I'd say two or three more days and that would have been it. So I, um, it seems to us that they, that's the thing that they're actually not controlling it. They have no means to control the salmonella infection anymore. And that's really interesting for us because now we can really try to dissociate the pathway and also look into antibiotic treatments and stuff. So that's, they are not controlling the infection. Yes, so that was just a hypothesis of what Caspase 12 could have as a function, of course. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well. So sometimes in malaria infection, people take up the spleen because the spleen is clearing um, in different model systems. So what happens in the salmonella uh, model system if you just remove the that's what has been done with carriers a lot. So when humans are known as carriers, then this gallbladder is being removed and then they will be asymptomatic and they will also, because um, carriers can also still spread by shedding. And so to avoid that and to dampen down um, salmonella in say endemic regions, the gallbladder is actually removed and then burned. Behind my own. <laughs> so in your um, Caspase 12 knockouts and Mozo, you I mean, the four Cosphase knockouts model, which includes the R12, I'm sorry, Cosphase 12 knockouts, like you stimulated with the LPS and there's no survival advantage. Whereas the salmonella infection um, in this uh, knock Cosphase knockouts um, shows there's a survival advantage. Um, and in both cases, I'll talk, I'm sorry, Caspase 12 was knocked out. So, so um, why is that? And the only difference I noticed was that so in the salmonella infection, it was uh, Caspase 8 was knocked out, so whereas the um, LPS stimulation experiments, so it was Caspase 9 that was knocked out. So, so do you think instead of a, um, has has 12, has has um, so I'll, I'll try to address <laughs> singly, I think there was multiple questions. So in the LPS model, we don't see a significant survival advantage on top of what we already expected from 111. So we do have more survival compared to wild type, and that was expected from 111, but we don't see additional effects. But when we infect with Salmonella, the 111, 12 mice, they also react very similar to the 111 mice. Um, is that where you kind of were going at? I'll be confused. And why would the salmonella infection, which is also a source of LPS, um, provide the, this uh, survival? Um, well, in, the, in our 111 or 111-12 mice, um, they will eventually clear the infection after a while, so there will be clearance after one that will survive it. But what exact role that... Hmm. I'll have to have a proper think about that because I don't want to hastily answer and then regret it. Um, I'll come to you later on. I've just, I don't want to answer hastily. <laughs> I'll think about it, though. Okay, we said, staying on time. Um, let's thank Rania for a nice talk. And <laughs>